hour number two. We're going to take a look now at something that uh, very few people get to look at, especially during a a very busy campaign season like this one, if not insane campaign season. There's a lot of material that we don't get to hear about readily that's going on. Uh, the Secret Service is talked about often, of course. People are worried about Donald Trump's security, uh, those supporting Hillary Clinton, the same thing. Both are uh, surrounded by a contingent of Secret Service agents. Are they uh, infallible? No. Uh, are they going to put up a protective shield around these candidates that can't be breached? No. Uh, there, there is pretty much a visual deterrent for people. Wow, gee, that's it. scare off those who are not so dedicated as to really want to do damage, I guess. We have a, a pleasure to have a friend of ours back on tonight, John Carmen. He is a former White House Secret Service officer who is with us tonight, standing by uh, somewhere down there. How are you, John? Good. How are you? Um, um, it does no good to complain. How's that? No, I understand. It's a loaded question. I'm, you know, how's, how's the signal come in? Five by five or what? Mm, mm, mm. Now, let me ask you, uh, Secret Service agents, how many are around either of the major candidates at any given time? What's a usual size team? Half a dozen? Or are, there, are they in layers? Is it uh, kind of like a canopy with different layers as you move away from the agent? Do they do perimeter work? How can they actually try to secure these people as they do? Yeah, well, the answer is pretty much yes, yes, and yes, but it's more than just a half a dozen. Um, even when uh, candidates are on the stage, they've got at least six guys right there at each point. So if, you're, if they're in a circle, if they're on a square stage or whatever, they're going to basically cover all the points of the globe. They're going to have one at each corner, which is going to cover, you know, um, 45% each, that sort of thing, so that they're all covering 360 degrees so that if they got to go up. And then they have backup people who are going to back up that position if they have to move in. And then, of course, they peripherally go out, as you say, in layers, all the way out to, you know, the perimeter doors, which is usually given to other agencies to help or assist, depending on the the, the load is, you know, depending on what the security load is. Right. So, you, know, you could typically have, you know, uh, over a dozen agents, but you only see a few because you don't know who they are. You don't, you don't have the experience to know. I'm talking about people in general. Sure. And you I, you I see, the, the ones you see with the suits on and the, the, the lapel badge, there are only half a dozen. You don't see the rest. Well, the, the ones that are in the immediate area have the special lapel pins. Yeah. They all have the telex right. uh, earpiece. And one photograph I think we were going to discuss uh, earlier was that uh, the telex microphone, this one agent, a black agent, was wearing his telex out of his sleeve, and that's normally through the sleeve, so it's in his hand, but it's usually his opposite of his gun hand. So he can raise his wrist up, he makes communication, he puts it down or does whatever he Talks into his wrist, Got it. and there's some other indicators. Maybe he had a vest on, and things like that. If you see a gun, you shouldn't. If you see a bulge, I'll see bulges, but I can just tell by their mannerisms, and you know, because I was there too. You know, I used to wear the same equipment and sure. all that. So now, let me ask you a question. We're we're talking, as some of you picked up on, the Hillary Clinton "Keep Talking" video, where she froze up on stage. There was a little bit of a a commotion in the audience and she just kind of shut down and the black guy stepped in from the right went right up to her she was still at the rostrum there at the podium and he actually and you don't see this you don't you don't touch a political candidate for president this guy came up to her leaned over a little bit to his right took his right hand his right arm and kind of wrapped it around her and pretty much patted her on the opposite shoulder and said keep talking don't worry, we're not going anywhere, it's going to be okay. And she still didn't come out of it. If you look at her face in that video, she doesn't know where she is. It was almost like a mind control, snap out of it, command. John, I don't know how you, you saw you watched the video. What do you think? Who is well, that guy? I've watched, yeah, I've watched this a couple of times, and I didn't see anything in his hands that would have been, would have been a threat. And technically... Your opinion is good on the touching thing, but guess what? 
the Secret Service gets to tell the president where to go. We get to grab the guy and shove him into the car, duck his head down, and all that stuff. So we practically manhandle the president or first lady if it turns into a security thing. But generally, we don't touch certain people, a male to a female, vice versa, unless something's going on. If something's going on, we're going to let them know we're there. So yeah. it's not a it's not a prohibited touch. Is what I I'm remember Reagan being pushed into the car, uh, getting shot. Actually, is he was being shoved into oh, the car? Yeah, yeah. And, and McCarthy and the other agent that just uh, died recently. He was one of the agents that uh, was responsible for shoving him in there. Mm -hmm. uh, McCarthy turned around, just got shot. He didn't have his vest on that day. I don't want to critique him too much, mm -hmm. but I wore a vest in '74. These guys were in 1981, but. You know, I, I don't remember if I told you, I interviewed Hinckley in 76, and they yeah. did not admit him to the hospital the way they were supposed to in St. Elizabeth's, and then five years later, he ends up shooting Reagan. So if you want to go, who was vice president that week? Um, George Herbert Walker. Bush. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. yeah. I, I could run a, I could run a thing that way too, and that looks interesting. There's a lot of interesting stuff because I'm not sure if you're familiar with John P. Judge. He passed away a few years ago. Oh yeah, I knew John. John his, was on the program. Family, mm -hmm. Right. Well, his family was related to Intel people and so forth. And I listened to a couple of his videos. He's got some very good stuff, and I don't believe Hinckley was the only shooter, but. Another subject. Well, you know? I've also heard, do you, do you, now you remember vis-a-vis -vis the Reagan assassination attempt. Reagan was shot in, in the, uh, under the left armpit as Correct. he was being pushed into the car. The first reports from the hospital were the doctor, now he was x-rayed within seconds as soon as he got to that hospital. They couldn't find the bullet. Exactly. Now this is what I heard. Now later on, it came out that in all likelihood, there was a second shooter. It wasn't a Hinckley. Hinckley missed. He, he got Brady, and I guess he got the agent. But what Reagan was shot with, according to some people, John, was a, a Teflon, like a disc bullet that went in and was designed to spin and do damage. And they yeah, couldn't see it on the x-ray. Yeah, we called it a flechette. Not exactly like the man from Uncle Flechette Dart, but it's still a flechette. It's got an edge to it. They can dip it, treat it, or put something else ah, in there. So, sure, they can whatever. load them up now. They've got all kinds of things, nanotech, yeah, you name it. Exactly. So that's, that's, uh, that's evidence right there of a second shooter. Now, well, John John P. Judge, by the way, just to point out, uh -huh. he timed it. He timed it. He looked at the film and he timed it because when they were shooting and the officers that were there, one of the officers got shot too because they were looking the wrong way. So you Secret Service, you face out to the crowd. You don't face looking at the president because that's stupid. You're, you're not protecting. But he timed it and said by the time Hinkley had finished shooting, Reagan hadn't been shot yet. And then the shot came up and hit him and you didn't hear it because it was one of those... Uh, um, the CIA special high pressured pump uh, type of guns or weapons like they had during the. I mean, like a, like an air pistol. Air pistol or rifle, yes. How interesting! So, yeah, Reagan was shot literally. If you go back and look at the video, as he's almost forty five degrees from from perpendicular, as he's going into the car, being pushed in. That's mm -hmm. when he got hit. And uh, they almost, uh, another quarter inch, he'd be dead. He would have been dead, and George Herbert Walker Bush would have been president, just like that. Exactly. And he still doesn't remember what he, where he was on uh, November 22nd, 1963. Well, I can tell him where he was. Shall we tell him? Uh, <laughs> yeah, tell him. <laughs> Jesus. You know, there's only a photograph of him on the steps of the, the building right there. Exactly, uh, yeah. And where still was Junior on that day? Did, did, uh, shall we tell him? Uh, he took Junior to Dealey Plaza with him so Junior could be a witness to history. Exactly. I mean, it's all just disgusting. And it happened, and you just and you just told millions of Americans, hopefully, that are listening, because that's critical information. It's been covered up for years, and they're still covering it up. Yeah, all right, yeah they're not going to give that up. Listen, uh, four weeks ago, Tuesday, there was an event, and it... it you remember the 19-year-old guy in Las Vegas who grabbed the, tried to grab the cop's service revolver or whatever he had? He had an SMI. He was going to shoot Trump, 19 years old. He acting like a mind-control idiot. You just don't do that kind of thing. Dumb. 
Uh, that may have been assassination attempt number one that we know about. Number two that we know about, but not many know about, I think happened a month ago last Tuesday when the uh, former uh, allegedly dead FBI agent killed in 2009 uh-huh, uh, was caught by a Secret Service agent trying to go up the service elevator in Trump Tower just minutes before the Trump motorcade was to come to the front of the, uh, the building and Donald Trump was to get out with his uh, staff and go up to uh, election headquarters. Uh, this guy was going to go up to the service elevator. He had the unstamped Glock and a silencer and was taken, I guess, down to some precinct somewhere, photographed, uh, booked, and then I think he was released almost immediately, funniest thing. And the only way that we found out about this, according to the people I talked to, and, and Yoichi Shimatsu wrote two really good papers about this, was that one New York City cop, who's a, a Trump supporter, leaked it. Uh, That's yeah, my understanding. I was looking this up while we were talking earlier, and uh, the Barry Lee Bush um, agent allegedly died in 2007. doesn't matter. A couple of years difference doesn't make any difference. But the fact that he was arrested and released sounds exactly like Dealey Plaza when they arrested the the, um, the hobos and absolutely suspects and things like that. Yeah. They don't just get released. You know, they're going to hold on to this guy, especially if he's allegedly dead. You have to ask the other questions. Well, what about his family? What about the insurance policies that they probably paid out and all these other things? Yeah, that's fraud. And they would at least hold on to him to investigate and find out all kinds of things, especially if they've already verified you, you his damn fingerprints. right they would. And they must have got him on fingerprints somehow. Uh, yeah, that's my yeah. guess. Yeah. Uh, the other thing yeah. is the FBI director, Mueller, read the eulogy at Barry Lee Bush's alleged funeral. Uh, this is in 2007. And you turn up uh, the volume a little bit, and Yoichi did the, the research and found out that Bush, Bar what a name, Barry, like Barry Satoro Obama, Lee, like Lee Harvey Oswald, and Bush, which needs no further introduction, Barry Lee Bush. How can you can't make this stuff up? So Yoichi found out that this guy was shot, I think it's a 9 millimeter submachine gun, uh, by his own teammate, they were staking out a bank robbery, shot yeah, through the shoulder. They it, yeah, they called it friendly fire. And when you catch yeah. that, you have to ask the question because if the bad guys are going to do it, like they had in a big shooting in Miami years ago or Florida, and that was a big deal because the agents were only carrying revolvers. One may have carried a semi-automatic, but they couldn't match the other guys because they had too much ammunition and ammo and, and guns and right. whatnot. But if it's friendly fire, it's almost like, uh, yeah, the guy popped off you in the air, and the guy says, okay, you've been hit. We're going to wheel you out. The guy's going to wheel you out. They're going to take you into the ambulance, and then you disappear like a couple other cover-ups. You don't die from being CIA shot through the shoulder. No, not unless you hit the artery. You that can, can Yes, of course, that can do it. But the, the, the chances are that this guy was simply sheep-dipped and put yes. into wet ops. I agree. I mean, that is that thing stands out like you, you wouldn't believe. And they already said something about, yeah, he's like 62 years old right now. And I said, well, if that's the case, he's one year younger than I am, and he can still do some damage. He'd do a hell of a lot of damage. In fact, he'd be less likely to be noticed because he is 60-ish. Uh, but his picture, if you look at that color picture of him, he doesn't look 60. He looks, anyway, well, he looks well, whatever. That, you know, that's a stock photo um, that uh, they put out. From somewhere. I don't know where or when it, it came from. But the, th the thing is, the New York Police Department would have had to have at least, if they did an arrest, they're going to take some pictures. They did the photographs. They did the fingerprints. And when I was with U.S. Customs, I put suggestions in to have exactly those type of automated systems on the computer so all they had to do is just roll their fingers over it and that's the fingerprint IBIS system or whatever it is and they get an automatic readout immediately through NCIC so he was mm -hmm. fingerprinted when he was an FBI agent no, sure he was. Every, yeah, right. Military, law enforcement officers, high officials, people with background checks, things like that. Everybody's got fingerprints, and it would come back. But the fact that he got released means he got somebody got a phone call through the commissioner, uh, the New York PD, 
And I don't know who is it, Ray Kelly this week? Is he still around or one of the other uh, cronies? Then that's how it works. And I've got contacts with people in New York PD and retired guys, good guys, that they'll tell you it works like that. Hmm. Well, uh, the point is this was a sophisticated operation. And not only was Barry Lee Bush sent in there to go up the service elevator, if we believe what we're told from this the source, but they had a, a patsy, somebody to create a ruckus and a disturbance down in front of the hotel. An off-duty security guard, former New York Police Department officer named Tony Shark, believe it or not. Tony Shark. Read the story. It's in uh, Yoichi Shimatsu's uh, columnist box. It's all there. It's very interesting. All yeah, right. I'm checking, out, I'm checking out Snopes as well, just to double check. No, no, Snopes, uh, Snopes was exposed. They tried to debunk this attempted assassination too quickly and oh. too conveniently. It was yeah, up I'm, almost immediately, and they said yeah, it was all Tony Shark. There was no Barry Lee Bush. Uh, right. So, no. Bush is white. Shark is black. Uh, exactly. Anyway, it was a very shoddy job. Snopes is not to be trusted. Snopes' government has been from day one. Do the research. Look up the uh, two that run it. Trace them back, and you'll see. It's in uh, Yoshi's paper, by the way. He, he got them nailed. He did a really yeah. good job researching it. Well, I hope he's going to be careful. You know? Yeah, yeah. He's a good man. It's pretty, pretty serious stuff, but as, as you look back in history... Everything. I mean, if you want to go back to Lincoln, you know, I mean, that's, you know, uh, John Wilkes Booth, a single lone man assassin, and they, they tried to make it look like one guy, and it wasn't. All the way up to Lee Harvey Oswald and, and everybody else in between, you know, and, and all the other assassinations and attempts, same thing. So that's the profile. That's what we do. It's like, yep. Yeah, Go patch you out there, have the backup team. Uh, the James Earl Ray, it was a military hit. You know, Martin Luther King. Right. And they told him, just go sit there in a the hotel. They put some gun in the area. That was it. And they knew exactly where to go to arrest the guy. And they were off in the bushes 100 yards away or 50 yards over. Yep. Yep. Exactly right. All right. The the day-to-day -day candidates, they go, Hillary's not doing too much now. She's obviously trying to rest. Uh, Trump is on the move all the time. The... What kind of an advance, I don't expect you to give away anything here, but what kind of an advance does the Secret Service do at a venue? What do they do? What do they look for? they got to start outside 100, 200 yards away uh, for obvious reasons and then move in. So how do they yeah. do it? What's it like? Well, it's it's not a secret. I mean, if you saw the movie uh, In the Line of Fire with uh, Clint Eastwood. No. Uh, John Malkovich, he played a bad guy, and uh, Clay Stewart was one of the agents on the uh, Kennedy detail, but it was later on, and he was fighting this thing. They always send out advanced teams at least two weeks minimum before the uh, candidate visits so they could do a, a pre-clearance. Uh, so they can get a look at everything. You know, if they're going to a hotel, they want to know about all the exits. They they have contacts with the local police. They have diagrams to show the nearest hospital and what routes they have to take in case of an emergency. They know exactly where to go. They've got cops that are going to give them an escort as well. Um, and then they start looking at places like, uh, yeah, they look in the rafters. They look up, well, Sirhan, Sirhan, and the, the Robert Kennedy uh, shooting in Los Angeles mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, they look at all these things, and then they have to do with crowd control and exits, accesses, and all that. So even at some of the hotels, and I've been to a few hotels where presidents, uh, even Hillary and uh, Bill Clinton, were in an area, and I went to visit, and I saw the details. So if I was taking another federal agent with me, and I, I recognize this stuff right away. So basically, they've got the whole hotel covered through a perimeter check, and then uh -huh. you've got to go through certain people, and there's all these people out. So you're talking over a dozen people right there. Perimeter, interior perimeter, and then in, in closer, and the more you, the closer you get, the more people, you know, that sort of thing. The, the crowds were, were so small and nominal that, you know, 15 to 25 people maybe, but the, those, those are just civilians, but the rest were active agents and canines and uniform officers and so forth. 
week, but um, everything is considered. If you even read any of the stories, it's like, yeah, they even carry uh, special backup blood plasma and so forth in case somebody gets mm-hmm. shot. Hmm. Yeah. You know, All right, it, let's, it, let's start on the outside uh, perimeter. How far back do they go looking now? now you know, a, a three a three oh eight uh, round can can do a lot of damage at two three hundred yards in the hands exactly. of somebody who's good. Okay, well, you just brought in the uh, counter sniper aspect. Counter sniper teams have to go. So what they do is they position themselves across the street, mm-hmm. tall buildings, and then they're outside and they're present on the actual parade route, as they call it, so that once they pull up to that one area, he's going to be exposed for that period of time when he gets out of the limousine and goes into the uh, pathway, let's say he's going into the uh, front of a uh, door to uh-huh. a building. To sure, a of course. Yeah, yeah, that's, so, that's so, maximum so that's, danger time, yeah. Right, so that's when he's exposed, and then they have to surround him and kind of cover him, and you're going to have to counter sniper teams and, and other spotters and so on and so forth. Then once he gets inside, they cover other areas, but they cover not just one side of the building. They have to cover all 360 degrees of it in case, like in Dealey Plaza, you had a whole plethora of buildings with dozens and dozens of windows. Oh, it's almost <laughs> impossible to watch them all. I don't know how anybody could. Well, they didn't have anybody to watch. They didn't have enough people there. They, no. All the team, all the team that you probably saw was the guys in the cars, and that was it. And they were, remember when the car stopped and the guy was waved off, and he held his hands oh, up yeah. like, "What the yeah, hell are you yeah. doing?" I saw that, and that that just upset me to hell because they called him off just before the shoot. Yep. And, and then Clint Hill was the only guy off to the left side because he was covering Jackie. Right. So he was the only guy to run up there. Now, the big guy looked like a football player got the, with the flat top. You know, you know, he goes back there and he acts like he's actively involved. He's thinking straight. He's doing the right motions and everything else. And yet all these things about the uh, allegations about them drinking till 3 or 4 in the morning, which is against regulations so you know, the night before. No, it's just uh, crap. Uh, also, and... We had Jim Mars on with photographs. I know Jim. Yeah, from the uh, grassy knoll, and he talked about a kill zone, and I could see across the street two sections of curb that had been painted, and I said, "Jim, is that are those two sections of curb with about six, seventy-five feet between them? Is that the was that the kill zone?" He said, "Yes, I never saw that before. It's in Marcus. the picture." And he said yeah. those curbs were painted that very morning, and he said there's still some yellow paint on those curbs to this very day. And that mm-hmm. was that was the zone. Hold on a minute, John. We have to pause. We'll come right back. Former Secret Service agent John Carmen talking about the political issues and protecting the candidates and more next. Okay, and back with John Carmen. The idea of an advanced team getting there, or let's say Trump has uh, two appearances in a day. you got to have about, uh, what, 50 to 100 people all together deployed yeah, in, in yeah. advance? You're going you're gonna to have to double whatever you had. I mean, if they're in close proximity, they're going to have to have this, this place set up before they even get to the second place if there's a separation of a certain amount of time. So, mm-hmm. All right. Now, the other question would be, how do they interact with Trump? For example, is it a first-name basis, like Donald would talk to them and say, Hi, Fred, how are you today? Hi, Bob, what's going on? How's the family? Do they ever do any of that stuff, or is it all just business? 
Um, yes and no. It depends who the president is, but you're not necessarily going to be doing that in a uh, social atmosphere or, or with other officials. I understand. Usually- Very rare, but it does happen, I guess. People do get to know. And if it's Hillary Clinton, and you know Gary Byrne, the Secret Service agent who yes. wrote the book Crisis of Character, yes, uh, he... he <laughs> She doesn't. She doesn't have kind words to say to people who are trying to protect her. Uh, in many cases. Oh, oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, I worked at the White House. I mean, I had uh, President Ford, his family, Betty Ford, Jack, Steve, Susan, and so forth, and then uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, Rosalind Carter and the kids, Amy. You know, in fact, in fact, I watched part of a Star Wars movie before you guys had it released into the public, which is kind of cool. Yeah, but. It's always Mrs. Carter, Mr. Mr. President, for Jimmy Carter, or uh, anybody else, Mr. President. If he's uh, a candidate, uh, Mr. Trump. Real simple. Nope, oh, Mr. Mr. Trump. You know, mm-hmm. Mr. Trump. Now, if, now, if Mr. Trump says call me Donald, then okay, fine. But in an emergency, it's going to get cut real short. They're going to jump him and shove him and grab him and rush him off, and he's going to duck down knowing, you know, he's a target or something, you know. Um, in fact, I want to bring up something real quick. Was when Jim Mars and I talked years ago, he wanted to know about something in particular on the parade route in Dealey. And I said, you know, ever since uh, when I was in the academy in 74, we, they told us all kinds of things. But one of the things that you know, they changed after Dealey Plaza was that they started welding all the uh, storm drain covers shut on the parade routes. So somebody's got advanced notice of the parade route by what, storm drain covers are sealed but they always have alternate routes so in other words three three ways and a trident left right middle or whatever and then they'll pick what you want at the last minute or they could change it at the last minute no different than if you're at the white house and i had problems with a guy that was uh, in traffic and i had to stop traffic and he didn't want to stop so i had to pull his keys and i radioed in i was getting ready to do something to the guy you know uh, he was acting a little strange, you know, uh-huh. or overreacting yeah. or something. Got it. So they, they automatically took the car the other direction. But these people know this stuff, so sometimes you got to be careful because they could have been a decoy to force the car to go to the other exit, you know? All right, another question. Would Trump ever bring in, let's just say Blackwater, a second security perimeter, a second canopy layer, that might or might not work with Secret Service to some degree? Would he no. enhance his... No. Is he relying no. on Secret Service 100%? It's, it's totally 100% Secret Service because there's, there's too many problems with having a secondary group of people. But if it went outside that perimeter of the Secret Service and it didn't matter... You know, let's say the military got involved, but when you mentioned Blackwater, you go, know, God, somebody tried to recruit me to go to that group, and that's a CIA-funded back thing through DynCorp or whatever. They're, I don't want to call them mercenaries, but they're people with previous backgrounds, law enforcement and military, and they can do certain things. But no, they're not interested to the top secret clearance level. They're not interested to secret service information or codes or radios or any of that communicated stuff because it would be too dangerous because they're not under the auspices of the secret service under the treasury department, period, you know. Uh-huh. It'd be like saying, yeah, let's put some whack in it, guys out there. Unless they're in law enforcement, mm-hmm. that's a different that's a different question. You could say law enforcement, then they'll take the local PD, let's say New York, and they're going to do the perimeters. They're going to be the ones doing escorts to do crowd control so they can get through crowds and so forth. That sort of thing. And they are given little, you know, mementos and thank you for doing this. And they technically worked under the auspices of the Secret Service. So they can say they worked on a detail or something. But sure. that's, that's an official standard right there. Now, that, Gary, that, Gary Burns' yeah. book about Hillary yeah. Clinton, how, this, I have to ask this, this is a, a generic question. How yeah. accurate do you think that book is? Well, I've scanned through it, haven't read it word for word, but I'll tell you this, I worked there too. I said it's 100% accurate. That's why I asked you. 100%? You know? Yes, 100%. I mean, this guy's as honest as I think I am, and I'm, I'm 
honest to a fault. I've actually had somebody testify to that in a case, and it's true. And he has a lot of integrity. God bless him. And uh, we've communicated over a period of time, not too much, but he's still concerned, and he's got some interesting stuff there that needs to come out. You know, he he he's described the same stuff. That say Larry Patterson, who I've talked to since '95 or so, when I first started coming out and I was starting to do radio shows and stuff, and those guys confirmed the same stuff about the Clintons and Bill Clinton and Roger Clinton and their habits and all well, those things. Yeah, Roger was supposed to be the, the coke source for for Hillary. Yeah, Otherwise, exactly. she couldn't stand him. Well, and Gary, all was it Gary Aldridge? Who was the FBI agent who was with the yeah, Clintons? Yeah. You know, Gary Alvarez was the uh, FBI agent. Um, I can't think of his book. I got his book. I met him and talked to him. He yeah, was he was of, on too. He's a, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, he was stationed in the executive office building where he basically ran NCIC checks on everybody who was coming in. But that was part of the malfunction of the whole Clinton administration was that they were letting people in who had felony records. Uh, Mark Rich's name comes to mind. Uh, the drug dealer who contributed over two hundred seventy thousand dollars to their campaign. What was his name? He, Mark Rich. Oh, sure. And he got, pardon right, Gate. Of course. A, yeah, yeah. And he got a, a full pardon by Clinton, which was nice of uh, Mr. Clinton, and all these other things that were going on. So Gary Aldrich participated in this stuff, and I tried to ask him about that, but. He gets blown off by Ted Koppel really easy. And I go, come on, Gary, stand up to this guy. You know, it's Ted Koppel, so what? You know, I've been interviewed by Mike Wallace, but Mike Wallace was a good man, you know, and people like that. But they just treat these guys like dirt, and then when they get out, then they decide to write a book. So whistleblowers, in hindsight, a lot of these guys, they wait till the last minute, get to retirement, and they think they're safe. It doesn't matter. That's why I went public while I was still inside, you know, that sort of thing. Got it. All right. What do we need to know about the Barry Lee Bush attempt, if that's true, and I do believe it's true, and we've got 70, 74 days or something until the election actually occurs. What do we need to know about higher levels of protection, higher levels of, of uh, or just dedication by the Secret Service. So they're going to be putting more people on each candidate as the tensions continue to rise. Yeah. Um, well, you just mentioned something. I don't know if I said it to you earlier, but I, I, I either said it to you or somebody else. When I came on in 74 in the Secret Service, I was earning 11600 a year. And I think the base pay was less than that about three or four years ago by a hundred bucks or no, a thousand dollars. But it, it, still at that time, that is, that was not enough money. You're going to sacrifice your life. You are asked specifically, you, you need to tell us if you'll jump in front of a bullet to save the president or his family or whatever. And if you don't want to do that, then you can leave now and nobody will say anything about it. That kind of excuse. And they actually said that. And that was very, uh, very important. And that kind of dedication cannot be measured in monetary uh, form. And if you did get killed, then what's left? And they, there were people that got killed during Truman. Uh, Kofelt is one name I remember. He was one of the guys that was out there at the uh, Blair House, which is across the street from the White House, because they were doing construction or reconstruction or doing some other work in the White House. So he had to uh, work across the street. And then at, home, uh, at nighttime, he'd go back and sleep at the other location or vice versa. All right, very good. What was that dollar amount again, John? <laughs> Yeah, eleven thousand six hundred for 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 base pay, and I think U.S. Customs had over triple that amount by the time I was looking around because I wanted to get involved in the drug war thing. Now, just but, to be sure, eleven thousand six hundred per year—that's not enough to survive on. You can't you can't no, survive no. on that. 